Welcome back to the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show, where you'll hear stories and insights from those who lead with faith. Joining us today is Monsignor James Patrick Shea, president of the University of Mary, to discuss where the church stands in contemporary society and how she can best operate given the cultural narratives of our day. Monsignor, thank you so much for taking some time out of your crazy busy schedule, I'm sure, as the semester winds down and, and joining us to talk today. Well, I'm really grateful to be with you. Actually, we had commencement um, uh, at the very end, the last Saturday of April. You did. And so last, last week, I was in Broomtree, South Dakota for a silent retreat with my whole senior team. And then the philosophy, theology, and Catholic studies faculty uh, join us for part of that retreat every year. And so I just got back from uh, retreat. I'm refreshed and I'm ready for a conversation like this. I haven't taught very much. So I hope you've got some time. Well, fantastic. That sounds great. I was I was going to uh, try to slip something in there about how you should be fresh and, and on your A game for us today, but you beat me to the punch. You got you start summer a little early then, kind of jealous of that too. Uh, that's yeah, that's, that's the, great. Yeah, in the old days, so the University of Mary in, from 1959 until 1986, when we became a university and started offering graduate degrees, we were Mary College. And in those old days, there was a time when the uh, employment market in North Dakota wasn't white hot like it is today. Uh, before the oil boom, egg sure. is really going well right now and all those things. And so in the old days, there was kind of what people talked about as a, a brain drain. Lots of people were moving from uh, North Dakota to the Twin Cities, uh, and they would try and make a, a life for themselves there. And so in an effort to assist employers, the sisters always set commencement earlier than the state schools so that University of Mary or Mary College graduates would be the first ones employed in our region. And we've just continued that. Um, we've continued that tradition. It's been good for us because probably for the last seven years now, we've been doing this year round campus model where hundreds of our students will stay on campus and do a full summer semester, not like a sleepy summer school, but they're able to finish their bachelor's degrees in 2.6 years or their master's degrees in four years with us through year round campus. So we're already, uh, we, we started today with uh, the summer semester. Well, that's fantastic. So it's May 9th as we record this. It may be a month or two before this goes live posting over the summer months. Uh, but at St. Thomas, the studio I'm sitting in, commencement is the uh, third weekend in May. So we're, we're a couple weeks behind you, but summer will be here before we know it and, and definitely looking forward to that and all the blessings that come with that. So congratulations, you made it to another, another summer. No, uh, praise God, it's <laughs> wonderful. Amen. So... A Catholic buzzword these days, we'll just kind of get right into it, um, that we hear about a lot is something called the New Apostolic Age. What is that? Well, right. Well, so th this is the idea, of course, that, that we find ourselves in a new age. This, uh, so when uh, Pope Francis uh, was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he participated in a gathering of the arch or the, all of the bishops of Latin America and they met in Aparecida, which is the big Marian shrine in Brazil, which is the most populous Catholic country in the world. Uh, and the Latin American bishops were talking about the cultural changes and shifts and societal circumstances that the church faces in contemporary times. And that's where this phrase originally came from that Pope Francis has used several times during his pontificate, that we're not in a change of age. Everybody says, I'm sorry, we're not in an age of change. Everybody keeps talking about how we're in an age of change, change is happening so quickly, et cetera, et cetera. We're not in an age of change. We're actually in a change of age or a change of the ages. We're not in an era of change, but in a change of eras. The idea behind that is that there's some moments in human history where you can draw a bright, bright line between everything that went before and everything that came after. And that we find ourselves, those of us who are living in the world right now, in one of those key moments, a change of the ages. And the, the change has to do with the way that the church operates or approaches the task, the mission task of evangelization in different cultural situations. And so when the church is facing um, the prospect of, uh, of winning the hearts and minds of people who are living in a non-Christian culture, then it's operating in an apostolic mode. 
And of course, the great model for this is the first evangelization. Remember when, uh, <laughs> when John Paul II, when Pope St. John Paul II introduced that phrase, the new evangelization, he was actually addressing another meeting of Latin American bishops. I think it was maybe 1982 or somewhere around there. They were meeting in Port-au-Prince in Haiti. And he, he used this phrase, the new evangelization. What's the new evangelization? It's the old evangelization. Right. It's the proclamation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But he said that it would be a new in ardor, method, and expression. In ardor, in method, and expression, we needed a new evangelization. And so in the, in the, in the, in the old evangelization, in the first evangelization, the church operated uh, in contrast to and in opposition in many ways to the Greco-Roman culture, which was yeah. a strong, robust, um, and, and uh, thick culture of its own. And the church came to challenge that and eventually overcome it while integrating certain aspects of the Greco-Roman genius into its own approach to questions like education. And so uh, for the first 300 years, the church was in an age an apostolic age, right? And then uh, at a certain point, uh, the church came to uh, confront and eventually to overcome that culture. And in the West, at least, in Europe and in the West, uh, civilization since then has been a series of what we would call Christendom cultures. And a Christendom culture is a culture in which uh, the primary ideals of the civilization and the institutions of the civilization are deeply informed by the gospel of Jesus Christ in various ways. Now, all through the centuries, the church has always understood that it couldn't simply operate in a Christendom mode, uh, in other words, uh, simply because there was always mission territory. And so the idea was that when the church was going to Papua New Guinea, for instance, it would need to operate in an apostolic mode. The idea of the new apostolic age, I'm sorry that my answer is, is so uh, winding and long, is that we find ourselves now in a new time, uh, which is very much like those first 300 years, in which the culture itself, the entire culture, has become mission territory. And the new circumstances are actually pretty stern for us and challenging. I know this is about joyful Catholic leaders, and I am joyful right. and hopeful in respect to it, but we do face very stern challenges because we're living in the first ever culture which once was thoroughly and thickly Christian, although it, the saints of Christendom remind us that even a Christendom culture needs to constantly be renewed and repentance has to happen and conversion has to happen. But we're in the first civilization in all of history, which once was Christian, but which through a thorough and consistent process has been ridding itself of its Christian basis and identity. So we're in the first post-Christian culture. Um, some some really astute observers, people like Cardinal Newman, have been observing this, had been observing this for a long time. And of course, the um, uh, the, the shift happened in Europe before it happened here in the United States. Yeah. And so people like C.S. Lewis were saying things like, um, you know, the, when, when the first evangelization happened, it was like winning the heart of a young maiden who had never been married before. And then C.S. Lewis said, the age that we find ourselves in right now is more like trying to win a cynical divorced person back to her former marriage. Yeah. Um, and that's a much more difficult task because people think that they know what Christian Christianity is about. Many many people are baptized, but they're not practicing or they're not at all interested in uh, in in Christianity from a serious perspective. And so um, uh, and so as a result, uh, they're very resistant uh, to hearing the gospel preached. We see it right now in May. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that happened while I was on silent retreat was the leak of uh, Justice Alito's draft that had been circulated of uh, a Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Right. And in the commentary, you see all of these catchphrases, which clearly indicate that people think that they know a lot about we, what we as Catholics and as Christian believers think about the world, about women, about culture, about freedom. And indeed, uh, when you scratch the surface a little, you realize that they don't have any clue as to the depth and the breadth and the capacious freeing nature of the Christian vision. And so that's been lost upon people. We're in a, to summarize, we're in a new apostolic age because we're in a time in which the church needs once again to operate 
without the assumptions that it already can rely upon a substrate or a foundation, Christian foundation in the wider culture. Sure. And you've put a lot of energy into figuring out, okay, where do we go from here as a lot of church leaders have, but looking at how we got to where we are today and having that context, I think can be important to the conversation. It's probably an entire chapter, if not volume in, in a church history book, but in maybe kind of a nutshell, Cliff Snow's, Cliff Notes version, how did that shift from Christendom happen? What are some of the key, um, you know, t- keys that, that turn to, to get us to where we're at today? Well, uh, so I think there's not an easy answer to that, yeah. a- as, you, as you said, uh, but probably the, the most concise way, the shorthand way to talk about it would be to talk about uh, the, the Enlightenment, to yeah. talk about the uh, secularization of culture, which has happened in the course of the last 300 years. The Enlightenment, is, um, as uh, serious scholars will tell us, wasn't simply a monolith. Uh, in other words, it wasn't simply radical secularization. Um, uh, there were lots of twists and turns that have happened in the last 300 years, revivals and renewals of faith along the way. Um, but what has happened is that um, that the old, um, the, the, the what many people understand to be an old and outmoded way of seeing the world, which is that there is a good God who created everything and that there's a moral order <laughs> that corresponds to that. And that in the midst of that, uh, Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins uh, and to teach us how to love each other and ultimately to grant us in, uh, eternal destinies um, with him and his father and the Holy Spirit forever in heaven. That, that vision of the meaning of human life isn't uh, truly satisfactory because uh, it deeply impedes human freedom and self-realization and our ability to define our own understanding of what human life is all about and what we're here for. And and so as a result, um, new ways which have stripped God and the church and the moral order out of the picture uh, for in in the name of liberty and self-creation have taken hold of the culture. Sure. That's a vi- but it's much more complex than that, yeah. obviously. Yeah, there's there's a lot of tentacles to that, uh, without a doubt. So the universe- you notice what happens is that it, 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 to to I don't mean to interrupt, Phil. No, I, I just ahead. want to say what what we see is that is that people, um, even who uh, who profess to be Christians, have have deeply drunk of this secular vision right. of this materialist right. vision of the world. So as a result, the, the furniture, our emotional and intellectual furniture is very much of, 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 uh, of the postmodern post-Christian world. This is why, for instance, down at uh, St. Paul seminary, um, you are implementing this propodeutic year, this, this year of formation, uh, which is kind of a, an opportunity for the men who are seriously um, considering the priesthood and who are beginning to prepare their lives for it, can spend a time in which they're deeply immersing themselves in the great tradition, in the truths of the faith, and in the practices which w- kind of rewire the brain and rewire the mind. Not brainwashing, as many people would uh, accuse us of, but really setting the mind free from all of the assumptions which are subconsciously assumed because they're swimming all around in the culture around us about who God is, wh- who I am, what the world's all about, what the meaning of life is. Phil, I see this all the time here at the University of Mary. Praise God, uh, we do our very best to be a faithful Catholic institution. And what I mean when I say praise God is lots of faithful Catholic families send their children here. Uh, but uh, it, it, just because they come from ga- great Catholic families doesn't mean that they haven't been deeply wounded yeah. by the culture's vision of, uh, of what's, um, what's true and what's false, what's good and what's bad, all of those things. And so we find ourselves with, uh, with a great task here uh, in terms of, of, of education, which is a reordering of human desire, not just uh, the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's apparent you take that very seriously on campus, but the university also recently published a book, um, you know, for the masses and the church at large, uh, Pastoral Strategies for an Apostolic Age. Pretty self-explanatory title, but why did you uh, decide to pursue this endeavor? And just tell us a little more about the book. Well, that's a very that's a very surprising thing. That little book, it's it's just a very modest essay, Christendom to Apostolic Mission, Pastoral Strategies for an Apostolic Age. 
uh, this was this was a manuscript which actually had circulated among a group of scholars and friends over the course of many years. People wow. uh, who I know who uh, who love the church and the draft kept going back and forth. And I always felt kind of guilty about it because I, I said, you know, we got to get this into print. At least I said this. I said at least at the University of Mary, where we're implementing many of these principles anyway in the course of the, the, the leadership that my team and I exercise here in setting vision and strategic planning and the implementation of new programs and all of those things, there is a method to the madness. There, is, there are principles yeah. uh, that, are, that are really important to me and to the church, I think, and to Jesus <laughs> in, the, in the current moment. Uh, there, there are principles that are at work here. And so, um, and so I thought, and I said, we really need to get this into print. And eventually, so it sat on my desk. Uh, it sat on my desk, and I thought, I just don't have the the energy to prepare this for publication. Yeah. You know, to go through it, I just don't have the energy. I don't have the time. And then, when the pandemic descended in March of 2022, um, we were able to sit down and really to go through it in a final way and get it together and get it ready for publication. So we published it mostly, and this is a surprising part of it, and it's a little bit how the Holy Spirit works. We published it primarily as an internal document, wow. not really for the wide world. We published it so that, uh, so that all of us who are working up here could remind ourselves and remind each other uh, what we're up against, uh, what brings us life, uh, what gives us joy, what, uh, what informs our decision making, uh, where we understand ourselves and our mission to be as an, as an apostolic-minded uh, college of the new evangelization. So fine. And then we put it on Amazon because everything we publish, it's not like we're not Harvard University Press or something like that, or Catholic University Press or Notre Dame Press or any of those things. We, we just kind of slap everything um, that we publish up on Amazon uh, and uh, most of it's, you know, um, historical uh, texts about an ethnic group that emigrated to North Dakota 150 years ago, that yeah. type of stuff, you know, not kind of mind blowing <laughs> things. But what happened with this little book is that a couple of people um, uh, got a hold of it somehow, I think, and, and then it just began to sell like crazy. And so, you know, at a certain point by that fall, you know, we were we were selling uh, 150 copies a day out of our bookstore, and um, that was very surprising to me. And uh, so it, it has caused quite a stir in the Catholic world. People say, you know, it's the best book I've read in years, and that is always a little bit of a scandal to me because it's something that you can read like in an afternoon. That's and right. So people really people should read books, I think, because it's just it's a modest essay. But I think. And it, it, nothing in it really is novel. It's what the popes have been saying since mm -hmm. Pope St. Paul VI, or maybe earlier. Maybe uh, it's, it's what the popes have been saying about how the church needs to interact in this post-Christian world. Uh, but I think uh, the formulation of it has been helpful to some people. And certainly, as I said in the preface to it, uh, it's been helpful to us at the University mm -hmm. of Mary, which is why we wanted to, to make it available to others. Absolutely. So it is from Christendom to apostolic mission, pastoral strategies for an apostolic age. We will include a link to it in the show notes, just in case you're not one of the people who's happened across it and checked it out already, but really hey, is a Phil, good read, and, and you're right. And, and you can use the note for the bookstore of the University of Mary, uh, sure. our bookstore link, because it's a dollar cheaper than on Amazon. Well, there you and go. I don't think our job, your and my job, is to make Jeff Bezos any richer, don't you think? <laughs> and so... <laughs> People can buy it on Amazon if they want to help him out, but sure. if they if they want to get a better deal, uh, they should just go right to our bookstore website. We, we are a show of the people here. We are we are all about saving people <laughs> money wherever and whenever we can. So yeah, thank right. you for that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, one excerpt from the book. Short. What we face is not a culture so corrupt that it is immune to the gospel, nor a populace for whom Catholicism has altogether lost its bite or its attractiveness. Our problem is rather that much of the church is still in a Christendom mode, either seriously compromised by the ruling vision of the wider culture or using outmoded strategies that were devised for a different context. So it's unable to cope with the current culture. The task at hand is to find ways to successfully engage members in the church and those outside of it with the truths of the faith. So a few questions off of that, Monsignor. First, can you give... 
uh, one or two examples, uh, concrete examples of, of, of outmoded strategies that are currently being deployed that maybe we need to move away from? Sure, but let me, let me give first a, uh, a prelude to that by saying that I'm deeply convicted, and I think we're deeply convicted, that, that this hand-wringing that we're doing in the church right now is counterproductive. The gospel is as relevant now. The gospel is as powerful now. The gospel has as much authority and ability to touch lives and transform lives as it ever has before, because the gospel is the is, is, is the permanent missionary mandate of Jesus Christ to a fallen world for our salvation in every age. And so the church knows how to do this type of thing. You know what I mean? We're not facing some type of apocalyptic situation unless the apocalypse comes, that's and right. that's not our choice. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't do that timing. And so I think it's important for us first uh, to not lose our self-confidence. In fact, maybe to lose our self-confidence, but to have ultimate confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit and the regenerative power of the body of Christ, which is the church of Jesus Christ. And so I think that that's really important. And then, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I'd like to speak in a broad sense to uh, the strategic questions. That's because I think a lot of people misunderstand what's meant by strategic because Americans are so practical and tactical. And so everybody's always going sort of this William James mode of saying, what's the cash value of these ideas? Right. You know what I mean? And everybody wants. So when I talk about this book to various groups, they're always wanting, you know, formulate a strategy for us. And what they mean is not a strategy, which is like uh, principles applied, right. but they want tactics. Like yep. what's the formula? Give yeah. us a formula. Yeah. Way, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And, 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 and this is this is frustrating for me because um, be, because partly this is the way that one is supposed to interact with principles. In other words, you're supposed to take them out into your craft, into your expertise, and apply them in creative various ways. And that's where the rubber hits the road in that respect. But I would say that that one of the primary difficulties is that, and, and I we say this in the book, uh, it's catastrophic for the church to operate in a Christendom mode when the culture has shifted into an apostolic age. Does that make sense? And we've seen that, Phil, in places like uh, Belgium, Ireland, Spain, and Quebec, which a couple of generations ago were, were the most thickly Catholic places in the whole world, places that had protection for unborn children and where mass attendance uh, percentages were very, very high and where there were lots of priests and sisters. And it looked for all the world like Catholic culture was really flourishing, but actually secular culture was, was being smuggled in in various ways. The church didn't notice it kept mm -hmm. operating in business as usual. Yeah. And then when the, when the, uh, when the collapse came, the fall was very great. And now some of those places, you know, Belgium's the first country in the world to legalize assisted suicide. Uh, we saw the referendum vote last year uh, or the year before in Ireland on the uh, on the human life clause in their constitution and how uh, by popular vote in Ireland, uh, the murder of unborn children was legalized. Uh, you, you see it if you go to a place like Montreal, wearing a Roman collar, people spit on you. It's really an amazing uh, shift. And so I think that that uh, that the church, so let me give you just a couple of examples. If you've got a Catholic institution, take a university, for example, because example, that is something that I know something about. In an apostolic age, the church has to, has to uh, use and form and shape its institutions with much more intentionality. Yeah. Because you can't just go along for the ride, and you can't let uh, the the ambient culture shape the ideals of the institution because that's what will naturally happen if you're not vigorously and very intentionally claiming the place for Christ and for his heart and for his mission 100% of the time and with great vigor and not allowing yourself to be discouraged in that respect. That wasn't always the case. There was a time when if you were running a Catholic school or a Catholic college or a Catholic charity, for instance, you really could depend upon uh, the, the uh, surrounding culture to assist you. And people came to you basically formed in the faith. Maybe they needed to be awakened to, to the deeper implications or ramifications of the faith. Uh, but but um, but it's much it's much stronger. Uh, the opposition is much stronger now, and it feels like if you're trying to renew, as as 
as Christian institutions always have to be renewed in every age, in all time, the renewal of a place in our own time is like building a house in a gale wind. It's very difficult. Yeah. You see that even, Phil, in the raising of children. You know, um, an example that I always give is I grew up 38 miles from the University of Mary campus, and my parents raised eight children on a dairy and grain farm. And uh, in those days, and this was, you know, this was kind of the last gasp of Christendom in those days, and that was the late 80s and early 90s, my parents, my teachers, my coaches, the Catholic priest in town, and the Lutheran minister were all on the same team. And yeah. they, they helped, they, they, they all raised the children together, yeah. you know, um, and, and uh, there was this sense of what they were all doing. My brother is raising his six children on the same farm now, all these years later, hasn't been super it, it hasn't been a super long time but all of the all of the um all of the circumstances have changed and he and his wife have to really do a whole lot more groundwork yeah. in order to raise their children to love christ in the church than my parents needed to do it's the same with institutions the other thing i think um th that the church needs to give a whole lot of thought to is the way that the gospel is proclaimed because what you see is that people have lost the, the narrative thread. Their imaginations are no longer formed and shaped by the Christian vision of the world. In, instead, the imagination, even if they've heard the gospel, even if they could recite some of the doctrines of the church and even assent to them uh, notionally, their imaginations have been so deeply formed by the secular or materialist vision of what it means to be a human being, of, of God, of, of the moral order, of all of these things, such that, 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 um, that they've given their hearts and minds to this other vision, which ultimately is profoundly boring. But what you see, because if you throw things out with a pitchfork, because of human nature, they come rushing back in in another form. What you see is kind of uh, um, uh, a... Uh, a culture which is enamored with epic story, enamored with epic story. And so, you know, you see the flourishing of the Marvel, Marvel comic franchise or of uh, the, um, what was that uh, show on HBO, Game of Thrones, yep. or um, uh, the Harry Potter series, which is, you know, a little bit passe now, but or even, you know, from a Christian perspective, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lord of the Rings, people love that. The Star Wars trilogy, that's not Christian, but the, people just laugh that stuff up. They love it, love it, love it. Well, we've got a better story than all of them. We've got, and, and, and it, it, it all came true, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so a way to, to recapture, and this is one of the things that we try and spell out in the book, uh, to recapture and to reformulate uh, the sweeping, epic, Christian vision of the world and what it means to have life with Christ and the fact that the that what the gospel proposes is the highest minded most death defying uh exhilarating and perilous idea of what it means to be a human being that's ever been seriously attempted or believed by large numbers of people over a length of time nothing even holds a candle to it. And yet people, as Dorothy Sayers said once, uh, people have taken to thinking of, of, the, of the faith as boring, as yeah. conventional, as beige, as, as sleepy. And uh, that just is crazy. Yeah. And so I think that those are some of the things uh, that uh, the church needs to shift its strategy and the care of institutions, uh, assisting people in the raising of children, uh, in a much more vigorous way, uh, and uh, reformulating the and, and reproclaiming the narrative of the gospel as an epic adventure. Yeah. We did something along those lines on um, Prime Matters, which is a website that the University of Mary uh, uh, uses to sort of get some of this content out there. Sure. On primematters.com, we've got this little thing called the Christian Mythic Narrative, which is a... Um, it's altogether, it's about five hours, but it's an audio project which attempts to retell the whole Christian vision of the world and reality in about seven or eight, eight minute segments uh, through the whole course from creation all the way to the present day. And wow. uh, that's an attempt uh, to do it. Father John Ricardo over, over at Acts 29 has published that same project as a book called The Christian Cosmic Narrative. But really, uh, it's along the lines of, well, Father Mike Schmitz up in Duluth, this Bible in a Year podcast, that's an example 
you know what I mean, uh, of, of how hungry and thirsty people are for this sweeping vision. Here's a priest uh, who, who's talented and, and, uh, and uh, you know, charismatic and likable, but he just goes on, on a podcast and reads the Bible and talks mm. about it for a little bit, and hundreds of millions of people flock to it. Man, Phil, th- this, this is a signal from the Holy Spirit about the power of the truth that we've been given. People really, really want it and need it, but we have to be confident and stop wringing our hands. Yeah, those are those are some great examples. I guess the follow up would be how do we get those stories and and that packaging of the narrative, that that telling of the narr- narrative, the Christian narrative, in such an exciting, engaging way? How do we get that in front of people, uh, especially in a world where so many people have even rejected the idea that you know there's a God or that um, you know, he loves me. And, and some of these prevailing things, there's these sort of base foundational things that it feels like you'd have to at least have some sense of or openness to for you to kind of understand yeah. the rest of the story, right? Yeah, well, it's not enough for us just to do a better job of preaching the gospel in our parishes because so many people aren't coming to Mass anymore. Right. But that's a good way to start, you know, because um, here we are back kind of in the tactical. Uh, I'll tell you, at a place like the University of Mary, um, we have a lot of students who come to us seeking God and truth, but we have an awful lot of students who come to us because they want to play NCAA Division mm-hmm. II baseball or volleyball, yeah. or they want to get a doctorate in physical therapy, or they want to study engineering, or we've got the number one nursing program in America, and they want to be a nurse or whatever. And so as a result, we have a tremendous opportunity for cross-pollinization there. We've got a, a so, so to speak, captive audience. They're not like prisoners, but they're <laughs> in our classes. And so if we're teaching theology yeah. in a bit of a different way, uh, that, that can make all the difference. Sure. What role does the seminary have to play uh, moving forward here? You know, that's where, where the leaders of the church in many ways get formed. And, and what role can the seminary play? Uh, you talked about it a little bit in the book, but we'd love for you to expand here. Yeah, well, I, I think seminary formation becomes a, uh, a really important and key aspect for us. Why? Because, um, you know, uh, the, the model for seminary education right now did arise out of a time of Christendom. In a Christendom culture, in a culture in which the sort of principles and underlying ideals of the civilization in large ways and small ways is informed by the gospel, the identity of a priest makes sense. And so a priest, uh, when he is ordained, uh, can really rely upon uh, the parish culture and upon uh, the the surrounding um, uh, society to assist him in living his life because they understand what he is and what he's for. In a post-Christian age, in this new apostolic age, everything in that respect really has shifted such that a a priest, a celibate man, living uh, and uh, preaching the gospel and giving his whole life to that, that doesn't make a lick of sense. What a psycho, right? What's wrong with this guy? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so people experience it in a very different way, not as admirable, not as self-sacrificing, no. uh, total gift of life uh, in the service of people, but instead as sort of a what? What's his problem? You know what I mean? What? What's the psychological problem uh, be, behind that? And so I think then uh, seminary formation, and it has been, it has been shifting. You know, you think of Pastoris Dabo Volbi, so you think of the new program for priestly formation, and the propedeutic here, which we've already talked about, yeah. priests now have to be formed for how they can uh, how they can stay true to their priestly identity in a new apostolic age, and they need to be supported, and they need to find support uh, in different ways uh, than they would have had to otherwise, in the same way uh, that one of the early missionaries during the per- Diocletian persecutions of the Roman Empire had to move through the world in a very different way. Uh, than a, a priest who was living in France in the uh, 1400s and <laughs> would have had to move through the world. You know, uh, it's just a very different set of circumstances. And so seminaries need to be very alive uh, to what's happening in the surrounding culture uh, and the, uh, the intellectual formation, but also the human formation has to be very carefully keyed to new ways to evangelize and to encounter the culture. Absolutely. 
How about the lady? What can, can you know, normal non-ordained schmucks like me, knowing that the world is, uh, you know, so vastly different than 50, 100 years ago, how should we be operating just in our everyday life? Yeah, so I, I think that when we're talking about the question of the laity, that shows the prophetic uh, insight and genius of the Second Vatican Council in talking about the universal call to holiness. Even if people aren't going to mass, as much as they used to, people are still usually or mostly going to work. And that's a place where people can encounter each other. And so I think to equip the laity really well with the capacity to carry this imaginative vision, which is not an imaginary vision, but a, a vision which shapes the imagination, which mm. captures and activates the imagination and helps people to understand, gosh, this, this is what I was made to do. This is what I was made for. This is who God is. This is what the world is all about. This is what my life is all about. To be able to carry that vision out into normal relationships, into uh, t-ball and youth soccer and uh, relationships with other parents at my kid's school and uh, in my workplace and all of those things, the lady has a more crucial role than ever before. And the council saw that uh, in Lumen Gentium and Gaudium et Spes, et cetera. Sure. Does it start with how a person lives their life and the example they set and the way they carry themselves and, and developing relationships before you just jump in guns a blazing, throwing, throwing the Bible at people, so to speak, or what well, does that sure. process yeah. look like? Right. In a post-Christian age, of, of course, it's, it's less effective than usual. Never was really effective, but it's less effective than usual to stomp around and beat people over the head with the sledgehammer of truth. <laughs> and so joy, joy yeah. does become... Uh, the great harbinger, the great um, preparatory substrate of, uh, of a heart being won over to Christ in that respect, too. Uh, our lives, uh, by our joy, um, am I still here? You I'm are. Sorry. sorry about that. Our lives, by our joy and by the, um, uh, by the, uh, the, the deep confidence that we have in Jesus Christ, is, that's meant to overflow. And people are supposed to look at us and squint a little bit and say, what's he got? I kind of want yeah. that. And we see that now, right now we're in the Easter season and you see it when we're reading the Acts of the Apostles. The disciples who had seen the risen Lord, they couldn't talk, stop talking about him, even though people kept asking them to. And so really it's very powerful and amazing. Absolutely. And yet in all this, I don't, I don't see you or other people uh, at least a lot of other church leaders advocating for things like, you know, a non-celibate priesthood or, or radical changes to things that are part of the, the magisterium. So how does the church kind of innovate and speak into this age without, you know, compromising core truths, essentially? Well, you know, I, I think, so take priestly celibacy as an example. So anybody who knows anything about church uh, doctrine and teaching will tell you that celibacy isn't uh, sort of uh, a dogma. Uh, it's a discipline. Yeah. Uh, but what's important about it is that, and in, in this I think is how we should uh, think through what's most effective in a new apostolic age. Celibacy points in, in a very potent way to the reality of the invisible world and the immortality of the human soul. Um, and that's, these are truths which have become slippery in our yeah. current age. And so for us to abandon them because of some tactical consideration, uh, deluding ourselves to think that somehow seminaries would immediately fill up full to overflowing if only priests could get married, that actually uh, isn't the way that things work um, uh, in, in uh, the, the, the reality of the gospel that we live. And so I think that um, when, when, we, when we're talking about the teaching of the magisterium, we know uh, that we're not just talking about quaint cultural practices, which might have applied in a different age, but don't apply now, and the church just needs to get with the times. Right. Obviously, renewal is necessary in every age, and expressions of the faith can change. But what can never change is that the, the church needs uh, to proclaim the gospel to an unbelieving, fallen world. And that means that it needs to awaken people in pretty bracing ways, uh, to the truth of the gospel and things like like uh, priestly celibacy are able to do that. They're also able uh, in times of corruption to deeply scandalize, and that's why purity of faith uh, and discipline is really important in an apostolic age. Impressive witness 
uh, think of saints like Mother Teresa and John Paul II. Impressive witness uh, is really going to win the day for us. Yeah, for sure. What's next? So you talked about how we really are at one of those watermark times really in human history where uh, the the game has changed, so to speak. And I think through, through your work and through the book and through a lot of these conversations we're having as, as a church, we've kind of identified some of the root causes and we've started talking about strategies uh, for solving it. Uh, probably a really loaded one that we could spend a lot more time than we have, but where, where do we go from here? What, what should we be looking to as we kind of go into the future here as a church? Well, so we should be looking for, um, for, uh, the cultural challenge to be stern. And so we need to fasten our seatbelts for various forms of sacrifice or persecution, which might be asked of us. That's good. Um, and it's always been considered an honor to suffer in small and large ways for the name of Christ from the very beginning. So we shouldn't expect a lot of applause from the wider world uh, for living the gospel. We should also prepare ourselves and buckle our seatbelts for the Holy Spirit to surprise us. Because just when all of the sociological studies uh, are pointing to the demise of the church, those are the times in which uh, if you have eyes to see you'll be able to witness the profound and surprising and very breathtaking regenerative power of the church. And so there are new ways in which the church is going to flourish in a new apostolic age, uh, but the, uh, the, um, the success of that grace, the, no, the success of how that grace is received in the world depends upon the personal holiness of those who are receiving it and spreading it. And so I think that, uh, that we should look forward to some pretty exciting times uh, that will be filled with some pain and challenge. Sure. One more, and we'll let you out of here, and I'm going to go back to something you said very close to the top. You do have hope, and, and you are joyful, and yeah. you do see uh, a good end to this narrative, to this story. How do you stay joyful, and, and, and why do you see that good end coming? <laughs> Well, I see that I see that good end coming, not because I figured it out, and not because yeah. I can trace a, a roadmap uh, there which has uh, clear contours. Uh, it's because I'm a believer, and I know that the 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 most dire battle has already been fought on our behalf, and the victory has been taken. And so I know that my work now, uh, and the work of those who assist me here, and the work of all of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and disciple missionary disciples in a in a in a post Christian new apostolic age, that our work is to be faithful, to be faithful to the truth that we've been given, and we know uh, that Jesus is bringing about extraordinary things behind the scenes in every human life that we encounter, and so uh, that constant act of faith is what fills me not with optimism but with deep abiding hope. And that hope is unshakable because it's founded on truths which uh, you can't find on the evening news. So good. Monsignor, thanks so much for taking some time and, and talking to us. Once again, we will include links to the book, but can't thank you enough for, for your work and your insight and, and joining us for the convo today. Oh, I'm really grateful. And I, I so admire the work that you're doing down there. And we're really grateful uh, for that in many ways. God bless you and keep in your prayers, the University of Mary and all our students. You got it. Thank you, Monsignor. And thank you for joining us on this edition of the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show. Be sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts and follow both the St. Paul Seminary and St. John Vianney College Seminary on social media and at semsp.org. New episodes drop every month on the first Friday of the month in honor of Our Lady of Fatima and the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. Thanks for listening and God bless.